Would you like to hear a ghost story? Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz and this is Ascension Presents. Why would we be so open to the idea of ghosts? When talking about ghosts, they're new. as Catholics, we need to have three caveats. Number one, are there any Catholic doctrines that establish the existence and the communication of ghosts? No explicit Catholic doctrines. In fact, there are some big deal saints who, who kind of um, shut down the idea that you could communicate with ghosts, but other big deal saints who said, yeah, that's, that's a real thing, it's possible. Number two, second caveat, in communication with ghosts. No, we're absolutely prohibited in scripture and in the Bible to have any kind of communication with ghosts. That's what they call the sin of necromancy and it's really, really clearly forbidden. What about praying to the saints? Great question, another video some other time. Okay, caveat number three is this. There's a huge difference and we need to establish this difference between the ghostly and the demonic because there exists a demonic reality that God made good angels that have rebelled against him, they've fallen. And those demons, those angels, fallen angels, they're not interested in our good. They're only interested in our destruction. And that's actually one of the um, ways you can discern between the ghostly and the demonic. Could there be ghosts? I'll say this, yeah, it's probably pretty legit. Here's some reasons. One is because it fits into our Catholic theology. What do I mean by that? I mean that there's more to this world than just the material world. There's actually a spiritual world. In fact, you are not simply material, you are also spiritual. You have a body and a soul together. At death, what happens? Well, the body and soul separate, right? And the soul, which is immortal, goes to what we call the particular judgment. And the result of the particular judgment is you either go to heaven, go to purgatory, or you go to hell. So it's either the church triumphant in heaven, the church suffering in purgatory, or hell. Also, scripture indicates, or at least implies, or at least some kind of, kind of way reveals that ghosts would exist. First Samuel chapter 28, where King Saul goes to the witch of Endor to conjure up the soul or the ghost of the prophet Samuel. And it actually happens. Now, Saul shouldn't have done that. Remember, Teresa Caputo, don't do this kind of thing. Don't do the seances. Don't communicate with the, with the dead. But, but is it possible? So the scripture points out that, yeah, in some way, in some way there can be, there exists some kind of contact between that world and this world. But here's the big question. Why would God allow that? Like, if that's the case, why would God allow that? Well, first, we have to know this, that souls don't, or ghosts don't live on earth, I guess. Souls either dwell in three places. They dwell in heaven, in purgatory, or in hell. It can manifest itself in this plane of reality in our world. But again, the question is this, why would God allow that to happen? I will say, for at least one reason. Because these souls who manifest themselves in this world to us, are, where, are from a very specific place. They're from the church suffering, from purgatory. And what are they doing? They're manifesting themselves to us on earth. What are we? We're the church militant. In fact, militant don't think like, okay, yeah, you know, we have weapons. Well, actually, we do have weapons. They're spiritual weapons. But the reality is this, that we're the church militant. The church on earth is the church in action, the church that's doing something for the kingdom of God. Not just for the kingdom of God that we see on this earth, but also for our brothers and sisters who are suffering in purgatory. I will say this, I'll maintain this, that virtually every time there's some kind of manifestation of the ghostly, those are souls that are in purgatory who are manifesting themselves to the church militant, the church suffering manifesting themselves to the church militant in order so that you and I can pray for them. They're not doing it to scare us unless they're demonic. That's not the same thing as a ghost. They're not doing this to startle us, to frighten us, to entertain us. They're doing this to get our attention so that you and I, as the church militant can pray for the church suffering. Speaking of this, I had the opportunity to speak with an exorcist a little while back. He shared some of his experiences with the church suffering in ghostly form. Here's an example. Uh, he got this phone call from uh, the abbess or the, the mother superior of a religious community. And she said this, she said, Father, um, every morning in our, our sewing room, the, the whole place is just kind of like all messed up. All the cloths are on the floor and all the stuff is just kind of, like, you know, lights are on, this kind of thing. And, and there's only one other nun who has the key. And uh, her name is Sister Rita. And, and Sister Rita is the only nun who has the key. Um, and so the priest says, well, and have you checked with Sister Rita? I mean, is she kind of going in there and messing stuff up? You know, is she a little upset? Like, no, Sister Rita died a couple weeks ago. Okay, the only, who, who else has the key? Well, I have a key, Mother Spirit says. 
He's like, okay, well, Mother Superior, are you, uh, you know, having some late night, kicking back on Grandpa's cough medicine kind of thing? And she's like, no, of course not, Father. He's like, okay, let's check this out. Is anything else happening there? She says, well, yeah, yeah this whole wing where the, uh, the sewing room is, for years, the lights turn on and off at random times, faucets turn completely on, completely off at random times, um, and it's been going on for a while. He says, well, how long has it been going on? And she says, well, we have a nun here who's been a nun for 85 years. She's been a nun for 85 years. And they tracked it back, and these things have been going on since like 1889 or something like this, like a long time. And he's like, you're just calling me now about this? And she says, well, because they kind of ramped up, you know, not with just with the, with the faucets and with the lights and also now with the sewing room and some other things. He says, well, is there anything new, special going on? He's like, yeah. She said, we're planning on tearing down this wing of the convent. And he said, okay, that makes sense. Well, why? Because this is, it sounds like, ghostly. This person has been trying to get your attention so you can pray for this person. And you haven't done it. Now, with the demol demolition of that wing, how will they get your attention? That kind of a thing, right? He says, here's what I want you to do. There's a neighboring monastery. Could you contact the abbot of the monastery, the head of that monastery, and arrange for 30 masses to be celebrated in 30 days for whatever intention of this person who's trying to get your attention. Okay, fine. A couple days later, uh, he gets a call from the abbot of the monastery this time. And the abbot says, Father, I'm not going back there. He says, how come? What happened? Well, I went into the room, set up mass and everything. And when I got to the Our Father, the part of the prayer where it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, the candles on the altar just went out. And, he, and the priest was like, okay, well, Father, was there a... Uh, is there a breeze? Like, no, I know. Was there someone playing a trick on you, you know, blowing out the candles? It's like, no, Father, n not at all. But I'm not going back. I, that's freaked me out. And so the priest basically said, the exorcist said, listen, Father, you got to go back or I'll send someone with some guts to go back and help you out. Fine. So send some other monks and they celebrate Masses for the next 29 days. For the next 29 days, 29 days, every time they get to that place of the Mass, candles went out. The idea is that here's some kind of unforgiveness that was happening. This person, in the church suffering in purgatory was some kind, had some, had to work out with God's grace, some kind of unforgiveness. So these masses were, be, were being celebrated for their, the unforgiveness this person was holding on to. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Finally, on the 30th day, the 30th mass, they make through the entire Our Father and the candles remain lit and intact until one moment when the priest said, let us now offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Then the candles just went out. And they took that as a sign that, okay, that person, that soul in purgatory is now at peace and is entering into God's glory in heaven. So there could be such things as ghosts. But the reason they exist, and again, very different than from demons, the very reason they exist and the reason why God allows them to manifest themselves to us is so that we cannot just be entertained by them, not just can be communicating with them, don't do that, not be scared by them, but to pray for them. They are the church suffering. We are the church militant. So let's get militant about praying for our brothers and sisters who are in need of our prayers, whether they manifest themselves to us or not. Pray for those souls in purgatory. Let's dedicate this year of mercy to one of those things being praying for those who have died. From all of us here at Ascension Presents, my name is Father Mike. God bless.